Hello and welcome to the 11th season of North Country Matters. My name is Donna Seymour. I'm a member of the St. Lawrence County branch of the American Association of University Women, one of the civic partners for this show. Today we are joined in the studio by Tom Grazier, the St. Lawrence County editor for the Johnson News Corp, and Dan Belay, who teaches civic journalism here at Clarkson. Tom, welcome to North Country Matters and welcome back to the North Country. You, uh, you're from Plattsburgh originally and you came back last October to start working for the paper. Your media career started in Plattsburgh at WEAV Radio in 1985 and you've worked in radio and newspaper ever since. So tell us a little bit about your history in the media, where you've worked and the kinds of companies that you've worked for just to give us a feel for uh, your background. Okay, well, yeah, I started, um, in fact, my first day at WEAV was February 14, 1985, so we're close to my 30th anniversary of working in media. Um, that was a, a small uh, AM, FM, there was WGFB, FM, WEAV, AM, and I was, I started out working in the evening uh, on a mostly automated station with a, a kind of comically run um, automated system with thumb wheels and gadgets that made it work and eventually became the morning show uh, host. In um, 1991, I answered an ad in the Plattsburgh Press Republican for a job at the Malone Telegram to write and um, had never really been, but I told jokes and uh, did color commentary for hockey games in, in radio. And uh, I managed to get together enough samples of silly movie reviews that I had written and managed to convince the editor that I could actually write. and. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and Will Doolittle, who is now an editor at uh, the Glens Falls Post Star, fantastic journalist, um, gave me the job. In 93, he left, and uh, I had been so, I just fell in love with newspapers. The first day I walked in there, I loved everything about it. I loved uh, writing stories and meeting people and asking questions. I loved taking pictures. And then the whole art of building a newspaper page was something I just fell in love with. And so when Will left, I knew how to do everything. So they made me the editor because it was easy, I think. Um, stayed there till uh, 96, and I married the newspaper's photographer. <laughs> and we decided that we could not work together. So we uh, packed up everything we owned in a Ford Taurus and drove to Asheville, North Carolina with uh, hopes of jobs. And I uh, eventually got a job there at WCQS Radio, which was a uh, public radio station. And I worked there as a morning show host. And in the evening, I worked in the production department of the newspaper doing paste up and toning photographs and, and that kind of stuff. Eventually worked my way into the newsroom where I became the uh, Night City editor and then became the online editor and then uh, the uh, assistant managing editor. And then in 90, uh, 2004, in an effort to move closer to our families up here in North Carolina, we took a job at the um, Marion Star in Marion, Ohio, which is a little town about 50 miles north of Columbus, used to be edited by uh, President Warren G. Harding. And, um, and I was the editor there until October when we got an opportunity to move even closer to our family and back to the North Country. Um, in, in North Carolina and in Ohio, I worked for Gannett Corporation, which is the largest newspaper corporation in the United States. Um, my WEAV uh, was a little family-owned station. WGFB, or I mean, uh, WCQS in um, Asheville was a public radio station that was not affiliated with a college or a hospital or anything. It was just off by itself. So it was a very small staff, very small operation. And, um, and now I'm back with Johnson Newspapers, which owns newspapers pretty much all over the state, but, st but it's family owned and privately mm -hmm. held. And based here in the North Country. And based here in the North Country. The uh, flagship is in Watertown. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, papers here in Messina, Messina, Potsdam, Ogdensburg, Canton, Malone. I think that's it. I think that's you it. You know, these last 25 years have been difficult times for radio and newspapers with all of the changes to the digital world. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about how those changes affected some of the properties that you work for. Well, you know, it's a lot is a good mm. answer. Uh, <laughs> We, um, uh, when I started working as the online editor at the Asheville Citizen Times, which would have been sometime after 2000, um, the online department was run by the marketing department in the newspaper. And, uh, and what you used online for was to promote the newspaper. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the night, 
after we had put the paper to bed and done all the things you do with a newspaper, we would spend 10 minutes picking out five stories, putting them in a little HTML file that would get put into a hot file and dragged up and, and erase the stories that had been there for 24 hours mm -hmm. and overwrite those. Um, <clears throat> big change for us came um, in, in, in September 11, 2001, when the, the attack on the Twin Towers. We had a new content management system that we had built ourselves with the programmers and uh, that we had at the, at the newspaper, which you had to have back then because you just couldn't get off the shelf stuff, mm -hmm. uh, the caliber we wanted. And um, <clears throat> we were about two, day, two weeks from launching that, and then the attack happens, and we all, the paper is filled with people. We're putting out an extra edition, and the guys from online are in the newsroom, and we're getting stories from the reporters as they write them and posting them online as they were having, you know, just lickety split. And at the end of the, end of the day, or, you know, very early the next day, the, you could tell that the newspaper staff understood what we were doing and they got it, and they had not entirely, but we had made this big step from being a place that um, printed a newspaper and then later did Reluctantly it. Reluctantly dumped it, re it out. Yeah, yeah, to some that worked together to uh, report news as it happened and, yeah. um, and, uh, uh, and then have a, you know, the print product as, as yeah. a byproduct of that almost. Um, now it's uh, many years later, mm -hmm. and we're still making that transition. Mm -hmm. uh, we still have, you know, making a newspaper is a hard, labor-intensive job, and it has not changed. I mean, there's a lot of efficiency that have got, come through over the years, but it's still putting ink on paper. It takes a great big giant machine yeah. and lots and lots of hands, a lot more than it does to do something online. But yeah. we're still making that uh, yeah. switch and getting better, I think. Um, the hard part is that, you know, the revenue doesn't follow. And, um, Bingo. The all, business plans. It is. Ah. And, and, you know, and the fact is that th these newspapers are uh, for-profit corporations, and making money is a part of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I've been fortunate in that, you know, when, when I worked for Gannett, which, was, is, which is this large corporation, they, you know, the, really the only product they had was news. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. even though, you know, they put a corporate model to it and would test your... Um, integrity occasionally, um, it was, uh, you know, they were, they supported the news product because that's what they had to sell. Mm -hmm. um, and with the, uh, with the Johnsons here, you know, it's the same thing. It's family owned, but their product is news and they support um, the gatherers of that product because they know that that's, you, if you don't have the news produced, you have nothing to sell. Yeah, and, 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 and it's funny, in my understanding of the history of newspapers in America in the last hundred years, is it has just been one crisis after another that 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 that, in, in, that newspapers have always had to respond to the ch to the other changes of America, you know. For okay, well, you know, radio, radio is here. How has that changed you? How newspapers and the and the cycle of of news uh, has has just gotten so rapid. Right. Yeah. I think that the the thing that um, I try to keep in mind, and when I work with the reporters I work with, is I say that, you know, we have, as journalists, um, no matter what the medium is, we have two jobs, and they are to, to, uh, to seek the truth and to tell stories, and to tell the story of the community that you're in. And especially when you work in small communities like I have most of the time, um, you know, telling those local stories that um, give a people a sense of the place they live in is, is really important. Um, we need to, um, you know, be the uh, watchdog on government. We need to hold up the standards of, of journalism that um, now that it's so easy to enter the marketplace of journalism, where there are the, you know, there used to be this big barrier of being able to buy a, tons of paper and, and gallons of ink. Yeah, and have a big print, uh, have a big print press. <clears throat> and now, you know, you need a computer and a server somewhere and you're in business. And... But we maintain this, this uh, level of integrity and um, ethics that is, uh, you know, ingrained in, our, in the companies that I've worked with for a very long time and, and produce products that, um, that, that people can trust. You know, in some ways, I think that small local newspapers are, 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 
uh, so long as they keep being hyper local, actually have a stronger future than a regional or a national newspaper in some ways, because nobody else is competing with you with the with the local stories right. and the local pictures. So long as you are integrated in that community, yeah, and that's a, that is the big challenge is to stay that course to be the um, yeah. the hyper local um, uh, entity in the in the in the uh, market. Um, you know, in Malone, when I was the editor in Malone, I believe I had one more news staff person than we have in Malone today. Mm -hmm. We have the same number of people there, and there are not a lot of newspapers anywhere that can say that they have kept their staff levels no. to 1990 uh, levels. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, that's, that's been very obvious as you watch the evolution of the news media, how, how much they have shrunk in so many ways, in many, many important ways. You know, as a, as a longtime reader of The Courier, because that's my hometown newspaper, um, you know, you, in many ways you're still doing the same thing that you did back 40 and 50 years ago, which is uh, who's been born, who got married, you know, the... Uh, the local uh, stories, uh, the, and, and you've actually chronicled the generations of lives of people who live in these communities. Um, is that enough, do you think? Are, are those kinds of local stories enough to keep um, a local paper going? Or do you really need to diversify and, and touch on some of the more regional stories or maybe even the statewide national stories? Or can you do just that focus on local? Well, I think we're fortunate in the way our organization is set up, and one of one of my missions to be the you know as I am the St. Lawrence County editor, and also you know over Malone as well, is to marshal those um, local products and combine them with the resources that we have in Watertown to be a more regional um, news organization, and with the uh, uh, you know with wire services to be a more statewide and national organization and to use those resources as best we can to tell to be as much of um, of both of those things as we can be. One of the things I guess that's really sort of been the, the good thing and the bad thing about newspapers is that we're a general publication and we try to be mm -hmm. everything for everybody and we're living in a world now of specialization and silos and and we're not that. I always, t you know, uh, uh, Trudy Ross a uh, dear friend from uh, Brushton who was the uh, news clerk for the Malone Telegram from the day she graduated from uh, OLVA Secretarial School. I don't even want to venture how long ago it was. Until a few years ago, wrote, typed in all those marriages and births and uh, first trout of the year stories and all those things. And, um, and when she retired, you know, I said to her that there have been, you know, Malone has been fortunate and had some really good journalists come through there and won lots of awards and broken a lot of big stories. Um, but none of those are hanging on people's refrigerators. Yeah. You That's know, right. the work that the Trudy did, rock. the work that yep. Trudy did is yellow and, mm -hmm. and hanging up there and will be for a long time. And there's, people place great value in that. And, and we are in a position as small town newspapers to, you know, to have that closeness with our communities and service that way. And you know, in the for, and being part of the Johnson uh, Corporation, that we have those further resources that make us more valuable for people who see beyond their kitchen. What have been the most controversial stories that you've run across been since you've been back here that, that there's a, uh, interest in in your community to know more about? In here, uh, currently, yeah, local, yeah currently. originally, yeah. Um, well, we you know we were talking earlier about the uh, the election, which right. was a big deal because uh, um, the county uh, board flipped from yeah. Democrat to Republican, um, and pretty dramatically, uh, much more dramatically than I think anybody really predicted. I, I thought, most people thought it was going to be closer than it was, and it wasn't. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, case with the St. Lawrence County uh, District Attorney mm -hmm. is uh, of high, high interest. Um, we were just talking today, and this is the kind of thing that, you know, you don't see in big city newspapers. But the story of the uh, dog in Messina who attacked a neighbor and who was sentenced to euthanasia, who was mm -hmm. rescued from that, that story is incredibly interesting, or of great interest to a lot of people. It gets mm -hmm. a lot of traffic on our website. And, yeah. um, you know, a, a larger newspaper might not pick that story up. 
No. And a small paper can do that, and people are interested in things like that. And it, and it, and it also gives people, you know, it, it seems, you know, unless you're the dog and the dog's owner, it seems like not that important a story. But it also gives people a glimpse into how um, their community works and how their government works mm -hmm. and the court mm -hmm. system works. You know, I remember hearing Walter Cronkite, who was, of course, the, the veteran CBS newsman, one time um, talk about how uh, he chose stories uh, for his news broadcast, and he said, you know, we can't just tell the stories of the cats who weren't lost. Mm -hmm. And yet, at, you know, at a national level, that's true, but here's the story of a dog who you could focus some time and attention on, and it becomes, a, in, in one way, a very human story because it's this animal that's caught up in this situation, and people do want to find out what, uh, and I'm what sure, I'm how, sure how the story fall gets on resolved. both sides of yes. that, too, that it's a... That it's a uh, Controversial in right. some ways. Oh, it certainly yeah. is, and yeah. there's, uh, um, and it is. It's it's relatable. You know, mo yeah. many of us have dogs, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and and not a lot of us have a, um, you know, interact with the court system, mm -hmm. and you know, keep you know explaining that to people is uh, um, goes on forever. You know, it's mm -hmm. always a, a puzzle to people. I think that um, as we move forward into this into the digital age as we encompass it, our, uh, you know, our goal is to uh, reach uh, a, a wide audience mm -hmm. with, um, you know, these good stories that are presented in as many different um, platforms as we possibly mm -hmm. can, and, and appropriately so. Sure. And it's, and it's a challenge, but we're getting closer yeah. every day. Uh, I, I got to tell you something that, uh, about the Courier and, and my perceptions. Um, when the office closed in Potsdam, it really made me sad. And, and I know that it is a matter of what the economics of the business are. In order to be able to survive, you've got to make hard choices. But I say, I, I, it made me feel very sad in that I had a feeling that, you know, like the younger generation are, may not have the same... Uh, feeling about the newspaper and but you know I got to say it doesn't look any different <laughs> okay because I don't go to it to present stories so I don't know how you know how folks right. do it um, uh, do you have an online presence for people to uh, be able to communicate with you or, or do they have to do it by letter or how oh no I mean there's there's ways to, to interact through the through our website okay um, that maybe aren't as uh, I mean, you have to look a little bit, you know, sure. go through the contact section, sure. and email is pretty easy to find. Um, I think that, you know, that is one of the, um, the things of the age that we, we all had to deal with is, mm -hmm. you know, consolidating our, our resources to do as many jobs as we possibly can with as few people allows us to keep as many journalists on the street as we possibly can, which is, yep. the, which is the goal of it. Yep. And, um, and of course, when they moved the office uh, out of Potsdam, I, I wasn't here. But now that we ha we have the central office in Canton, which has a, a, a lot of people working in it, okay. and I have access to them okay. easy. We have we do have a, a presence in Messina because our press is up mm -hmm. there, and so we have we run an office out of there. But the other you know nice thing about the digital age is that our journalists can go wherever mm -hmm. and can be in touch with me and adding stories. You know we were. Um, covering uh, a story from the, two stories from the courthouse last week, that um, our reporter in the courthouse was texting me uh, updates, and I was typing them into the story, and then publishing the story live as it mm -hmm. went. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, and as long as you can connect now, which you can in most places, we can move um, things pretty fast. Uh, my, you know, when I, I and I've been a, involved in online productions for quite some time, mm -hmm. and I have always been a believer in low-tech solutions mm -hmm. to these high-tech things, a text message, simplest thing in the world, and, uh, and, we are, and it's just like um, the old rewrite guy that you would see in, you know, you see in the old <laughs> movies these days, and that's really what I'm doing, you know, taking the story and writing it from the little tidbits that I'm getting as they go along, um, and there are lots of little things we can do like that that can speed up our process. And, and get the online readers what they want, which is the news as fast as they can mm -hmm. possibly get it. Mm -hmm. Not so much interested in depth or context that our print readers are gonna want the next morning. Mm -hmm. and, and some of those are the same people, but many of them are not. 
The, uh, one of the things that I notice uh, from the community point of view is, is how much easier it is to um, submit stories now if, you're, if you belong to an organization and you want to tell your story or get a piece of news out. Very, very easy to submit it, much more than it used to be when you had to present a piece of paper down at the office during office hours. Now, whenever you want to send something, you can send it, and right. it, like magic appears on your desk. Yeah. And there are also mm -hmm. um, ways that you can send calendar items in mm -hmm. yep. that where, where you enter all the information and we just approve it over the thing, and there it is. Um, yeah, the uh, copy and paste is my favorite. <laughs> cool. um, I, you know, from a, I deal a lot with letters to the editor, and mm -hmm. um, and people like their letters to the editor to be what they wrote, and uh, and mistakes happen when you type things over. You know, when you have to, uh, as we say, key in mm -hmm. um, stories. But the, the copy and paste thing makes that that possible, and the editing is much simpler to do. The the having giving people access. Um, to the to uh, to us is the, the most important thing, and making it uh, as easy as we possibly can. And I do believe that in the past, in the in the dark past, mm -hmm. that that mm -hmm. we threw up a lot of barriers because we we wanted to be the arbiters of everything. Yeah. And and that attitude has changed quite a bit. You know, we're and to, you know if you're not open to everybody, they've got places to go. Right. You mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And so we're we, we're we're more than willing to work with anybody who wants to to helps tell the story of our communities. Yeah. yeah. So, Tom, tell us a little bit about what's coming down the pike. Uh, you know, what, what, is, uh, what are you thinking in terms of things that you'd like to maybe see as the editor, or what are some of the, maybe the technology changes that the Johnson uh, family is working mm -hmm. on for being able to tell our local stories? Well, we are working on, um, the, the main thing that I want to do is, um, is to work faster, to be more uh, digitally aware of what we're doing. Um, we are, um, by the nature of the, the way our newsrooms are set up through, you know, legacy mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. habit, uh, we tend to aim everything towards our print product. And, and, I, and I'm yeah. moving us into more into the digital age. We do okay, and, and the people who uh, were here before me did a great job. And, and in my my uh, job is to go a yeah. further step, and um, and we're going to do that in, in a number of different ways. But man, much of it is a culture change, mm -hmm. and to get our reporters mm -hmm. thinking about what they're going to do digitally with their stories and how they're going to get that information in as fast as we possibly can, as fast and as accurate, as fair yeah. and as uh, full of context and depth as we possibly can in a in a short period which of time. is always a difficult thing you know we look at what was going on in France two weeks ago with the terrorists yes and you've got every single one of those media outlets trying to scoop the other one as has always been the case but it seems like there's now more opportunity for mistakes because of that need for speed yeah and it's and it's a uh, it's difficult when you, you know, when you watch them, especially after there's been, you know, if we say after the Boston Marathon bombing when there were so many erroneous reports as that was going, and then you, and you watch subsequent uh, events happen, you hear all these qualifying words from the TV mm -hmm. announcers, you know. From what we know. Vamping until yeah, they can get yeah. some news. And, uh, and qu you know, so they're not, yeah. well, we didn't say that. We said we thought that. <laughs> um, and, and, so, and we, you know, we have a different uh, culture in that, you know, we want to confirm, you know, we hear it on the scanner, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we hear it on the scanner and a guy down the block has posted it on Facebook, you know, that, oh, the police are at this street doing this. And, and we know that, but we don't report that until we've called the dispatcher yeah. and, or yeah. sent a reporter down there and seen it. And then we get it up as fast yeah. as we possibly can. You know, and, that, you mentioned that the scanner that reminded me of something that we um, I talked about uh, a couple of years ago with the candidates for district attorney uh, that in a lot of cases when um, there is something that's happening uh, in the police scanner that involves a local family you can give too much information about uh, what's happened that actually has a really negative impact on members of the family like you know kids or something like that and that's always a sensitive um, a sensitive thing about how do you report the news and yet still protect the innocent right. who mm -hmm. um, 
or don't, uh, you know, it's not their fault that they have a relative that's done something uh, bad. How do, we, how do we take care of that kind of need to protect the innocent? You know, it's, it's funny is that you, that's one of the things that, that as an editor over the years I've gotten the most earfuls about mm -hmm. from disgruntled readers or, and um, it's, you know, it's something that we think about all the time. One of, like, you know, a, a big thing right now is if there's an automobile accident, especially where there's a fatality, fatality concern, we don't put pictures up of the car until we know that the uh, next of kin have been notified. Right. And that's a conscious thing. Yep. But it's, you know, sometimes there's a slip up on that, but I mean, that's right. something we think about um, so that people don't find out through, uh, through us uh, something terrible happening in their families. Um, when it comes to uh, victims, you know, it's a, it's a tightrope that you walk and it's something that, you know, we talk about all the time. When, when are we gonna say who this was yeah. or, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, we covered a, a heartbreaking case in, in Ohio, my newspaper, of a, an 11 year old girl who had, uh, who had suffocated her seven year old cousin. And they tried her, which I, was fairly outrageous. And, uh, and every, uh, tele, and, you know, the Columbus television stations covered this, and they all covered it, and they used the little girl's name throughout. And we did not. And I said that I was, we were not going to use her name until it had been completely adjudicated. And that mm -hmm. it had, you know, if there was ever a chance that maybe this was something that, you know, I didn't want to be the one who was talking about this little 11 year old girl uh, who had this unfortunate thing happen. And, you know, and eventually, he was, you know, we did name her at the very end when it was all through, when it, all the appeals and stuff. But um, it was a, you know, for my part, it was a principled stand. Mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. and maybe futile, but. Um, something that I'm glad that I did and I feel good about yeah, yeah. these ways. So it's, you know, we, um, I, you know, we, the, those sensitive things are not, um, we don't do knee jerk mm -hmm. reporting. We think about it yeah. all the time. We have so many conversations. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and you know, you, write, you, were, you were talking about before, essentially having one foot in the digital age and one foot yeah. still in the other What's the business model to survive in yeah. that? Because the, the online people, we're not used to paying for news online. Right, yeah, it's funny. That's uh, the, one of the things that keeps us so anchored to the print product is that it is, that's where the revenue is right now. Yeah. And it does not look like that any model that we have right now is gonna produce the revenue online anywhere near what um, the newspaper did. And, and, and that's, that's just, not just, that's not that's, just useful, no, that's across the well, board. Well, I think of, of Long Island Newsday, yeah. then when they decided to go digital and they went from a base of 100,000 subscribers to 7,000. Yeah. yeah. And I've, and, you know, in the other places I've worked, we've had paid uh, online yeah. models and um, all sorts of different ones, paywalls that you can get through and foul balls, they call them, where you can, sometimes you can get on, sometimes you can't. And um, they, none of them have been really successful. And... Uh, and even the papers that have had some success, like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, have had some yep. success with theirs. Yep. You know, if, if you read the news, they're laying off they're, they people still struggle, too. Right? Yeah. Yes. They still so struggle. it's a, yes. you know, uh, uh, I've been. There's a song going through my head almost every day now. Um, uh, Gillian Welch does, does a song called uh, uh, "Everything Is Free Now," <laughs> and uh, you know she's and the, and the refrain says, you know, they figured it out. We're going to do it anyway, even if it doesn't pay. And I, and I don't think journalism is going away. No. And I don't think, uh, you know, there'll always be someone to, to do that. The, the, the test is going to be, is it, are we going to be able to support professional journalists, you know, pay them a professional price, uh, pay a professional pay, so that you have that um, integrity and context mm -hmm. and depth mm -hmm. um, that I'm afraid you don't have when everything is free. And so that's the challenge, yeah. not just to um, us, as organizations, as private companies that produce news, but as communities that yeah. want to be informed and yeah. protected. Yeah. Well, Tom, yeah. Um, this half hour has flown Whew. by, as they always do, so thank you very much for coming in. I think everybody's um, appreciated the opportunity to get your, hear your thoughts and to get a sense of who you are, the guy behind the print, and uh, so we appreciate that. Our time is up, thank you all. These conversations are a production of North Country Matters produced here in the studios of WCKN on the campus of Clarkson University. 
This show is a civic collaboration between the St. Lawrence County branch of the American Association of University Women, the St. Lawrence County League of Women Voters, and the Communication and Media Department here at Clarkson. Until next time, remember, our North Country matters. Thank you very much. Thank you.